They used to call this island the Paris of the East, mostly because it had beautiful buildings with large gardens and impressive stone archways. But now, it's nothing like it used to be, with all the architecture almost entirely covered in tree roots and vines. Ross Island is a small territory in the Indian Ocean. It's located east of the Indian city of Port Blair. Though initially thought of as a jail, Ross Island eventually became a luxurious resort for the local administrators. They called this island a real treat for its more privileged residents. It boasted opulent bungalows, stained glass window panels brought all the way from Italy, neatly kept gardens, tennis courts, and even swimming pools. Soon after the complex was closed in 1937, a powerful earthquake hit the island. It caused a lot of damage, making it even more uninhabitable. The island is now in the administration of India and has become a tourist attraction for people interested in abandoned towns. Pieces of German architecture still lie hidden in the Namibian desert. The city of Kolmanskop, Namibia, was a luxury location at its peak in the early 1900s when German workers settled here looking for diamonds. This abandoned town used to have everything from a ballroom to a hospital and even a bowling alley. It all started to decline somewhere in the late 1910s when another diamond-packed location was found nearby. So, most of the people living here moved, leaving everything behind in search of more money. Kolmanskop has since been slowly occupied by sand dunes, while the hot temperature and low moisture helped to preserve the buildings. This ghost town is also available for visitors. If it sounds interesting, you can book a tour in the nearby town of Luderitz. Another abandoned castle dominates the view in Krakow, a city in Italy. The whole village sits atop a cliff that's 1,312 feet high. The founders liked this location since they knew it would be easy to defend themselves from unwanted guests. But the castle, built in the 1300s, soon became overwhelmed by landslides and earthquakes. Even though it has no residents anymore, the medieval city often comes alive during the various local festivals that take place here in the summer months. The locals also offer tours and tell amazing stories about the location. One of the highlights of the tour is a statue that seemingly came out of nowhere and now lies in a body of water. Hidden away in the Montana mountains, Garnet Ghost Town tells the well-known American story of the West's Gold Rush. The town's history goes back to the 1890s when they found a lot of gold in the Nancy Hanks mine. During its glory days, Garnet had almost 1,000 residents. Even though it's in a relatively secluded location, it had saloons, hotels, stores, a school, and other features of a regular little town. In 1905, when most of the gold had already been taken away, most mines were left behind, so only a couple of hundred residents stayed in Garnet. The final straw came in 1912, when a fire damaged most of the town's buildings. So, by the 1940s, Garnet was completely abandoned. It soon became a hotspot for treasure hunters looking for furnishings and artifacts. That was until a preservation campaign started in the 1970s. It ended with the town being declared a historic district in 2010. To this day, Garnet is one of the best preserved ghost towns in the area. Hashima Island is another abandoned location that tells us that when people leave, nature takes over. This mysterious place was even featured in a James Bond movie because of its ghostly landscape. It used to be a well-known spot in Japan for undersea coal mines as it was opened in 1881. In 1959, at its peak, there were over 5,000 people living here, including mine workers and their families. As soon as the mines started going dry, sometime in 1970, people started to slowly depart the island leaving it completely abandoned in three months. Even though nobody lives there these days, there are a lot of tourists here that drop off to wander around the abandoned homes, swimming pools, stores, and factories. Another town that started with a mining company back in 1881 is Calico, California. People discovered the location was packed with silver, so it soon became home to over 500 silver mines and 3,000 residents. It used to feature hotels, 
general stores, restaurants, and a school. There was even a local newspaper printed here called the Calico Print. But by 1986, the town had become empty. One of the former locals decided to buy it and began its restoration, making it a registered historical landmark. It even has a museum of the Old West available for tourists. One of the most interesting attractions that were rebuilt is the one-mile-long Calico and Odessa Railroad. It currently goes through the steep canyons and hills and even passes the old mines and buildings north of Calico. Approximately one-third of the town is original, while the rest consists of newer buildings that are replicas meant to recreate the spirit of its past. If you're a fan of cars, you might have heard of Henry Ford as the famous American industrialist who founded the Ford Motor Company in 1903. But in 1927, he began working on another one of his ambitious dreams, Fordlandia. It was supposed to be a massive rubber plantation located near the Tapajos River in Brazil, since he needed a reliable source of rubber for his car tires and hoses. His vision was to design a town complete with swimming pools, a golf course, living bungalows, and even weekly square dancing sessions for the locals. This project was unfortunate to begin with, since the local rubber trees soon got infected with leaf fungus. Even though Henry Ford invested a staggering $20 million into this potential income source, the town failed to produce the needed rubber. He had nothing left to do but to sell it to Brazil in 1945, and soon it was completely abandoned. Many of its buildings are still standing, but have been taken over by the surrounding nature. You can still see curious tourists wandering through it to this day. During its glory days, Hampi was the second largest city in the world. Looking at its ruins today, it's hard to imagine this Indian city used to be filled with temples and bazaars and that it served as an important center of the Mauryan Empire in the 14th and 15th centuries. It was destroyed in the 16th century, but it still has beautifully preserved forts and markets. It became part of the UNESCO World Heritage in 1986, aiming to protect its buildings, such as the Lotus Mahal, a stone structure that was carved to resemble a lotus flower opening to the sun. A tourist village was constructed back in 1920 along the shore of Epicuan, a salt lake about 370 miles southwest of Buenos Aires in Argentina. It was designed to provide people with a busy city life a breath of fresh air near the restorative salt waters of the nearby lake. It was soon equipped with a railroad station and ended up having a population of more than 5,000 residents. The project was also destined to fail soon enough, as the unusual amount of rain at that time caused Lake Epicuan to swell. In 1985, the water took over the local dam and the town was flooded. The waters were so deep that they even reached a depth of 33 feet in 1993. They only began to recede in 2009 and left behind the remaining buildings, literally encrusted in salt. No one came back to the town except for Pablo Novak, who returned here back in 2012 and was the only resident of Villa Epicuan at the time. Today we're going to an art history trip. Our main focus is to unravel the mystery of whether or not ancient statues has always been white. We'll visit museums and even time travel to try and get a glimpse of what these statues were really like back in the day. To kick off our tour, we land in New York. We climb the famous steps of the Met, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and walk inside this enormous museum. You walk down the aisle and get to the room, where one of the world's biggest collections of ancient Greek and Roman statues is held. Admiring the large array of statues, one thing seems evident. They are mainly white. It makes sense, since their primary material is white marble. For centuries, historians, archaeologists and researchers in general have always taken this fact for granted. Weren't these statues always white? Until recent decades, this wasn't something that people discussed. But in the 1980s, researchers unearthed an ancient Greek statue that was clearly pigmented. This new discovery made them wonder, were all ancient statues painted? Let's take a close look at this work of art. 
This third century before the Common Era, Greek statue was discovered to be almost entirely painted, still in its original form. You don't have to look too hard to notice that the statue still carries some of these original pink colors, with some shades of blue and red paint as well. The thing is, this statue is not an exception, it's the norm. As it turns out, ancient civilizations did paint their sculptures with bright and vivid colors, but somewhere along our historic timeline this information got lost. According to researchers, pigment in sculptures was a way of bringing their representations closer to real life. We live in bright colors, so art might as well reflect that, right? Right! So let's take a few steps back to understand what happened. So why are our museum's galleries filled with white statues as far as the eye could see? You might have heard of Michelangelo. It's a famous Italian sculptor who carved the iconic David and painted the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Michelangelo was one of the most emblematic painters of the Renaissance. The Renaissance was a historical period when European artists, philosophers and scientists developed a renewed interest in the creations of ancient Greece and Rome. Artists like Michelangelo studied a series of Roman sculptures, like this one, the Leo Colon and his sons. They fell in love with their lifelike figures and pristine white marble. The one thing they didn't know, and didn't have the technology to know, was if the colored pigments from those sculptures had faded. After all, they were found after years of being buried or left in the open air. It's speculated that this statue, the Leo Colon, had colored snakes and mantles, for example. When the Renaissance artists set out to pay homage to ancient artists, they left their masterpieces bare too. They carved directly onto the marble and left them white, without pigmentation. Probably because that's the way they thought things were done in the old days. The works of Michelangelo and his peers influenced a whole generation of sculptors after that. So this way of doing art traveled to modern times without much questioning. However, evidence of color pigments in ancient statues is abundant. Some researchers show that scholars have known for at least a century that ancient sculptures weren't originally all white. Other studies suggest that this discovery might have happened even earlier. In early 1980s, archaeologist Vincent Brinkman made a huge discovery. During his time as a student at the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, he developed a technology that was able to detect polychromy in ancient samples of Greek statues. Polychromy is an art of painting in several colors. Anyways, he was taken aback by his discovery and confused as to why and how other researchers and archaeologists weren't talking about this. As it happens, the first discovery that ancient statues weren't all that white happened a long time ago, way before Vincent was born. It happened during the unearthing of Pompeii, back in the 1700s. As you may know, the city of Pompeii in southern Italy was completely covered with lava after the sudden eruption of Mount Vesuvius. The city was destroyed, but the clouds of ashes that arose from the lava managed to preserve a lot of the city's structure through time. Thankfully for art historians and archaeologists, Pompeii became a digging ground for understanding ancient Rome. Researchers found several concert frescoes that depicted scenes of daily Roman life. In one of these paintings, an artist is seen painting a sculpture. This fact was recorded by a very famous art historian known as Johann Joachim Winkelmann. He is also considered the father of art history. Now let's take a closer look at another famous statue. To see this one in person, you have to fly all the way to Rome and visit the Vatican museums. The statue you're looking at is a classic representation of Caesar Augustus. In case you didn't know, he was the founder of the Roman Empire and the first emperor of Rome. He is important. The sculpture you're seeing is called the Augustus of Prima Porta. You may have seen this before, probably in a history textbook. 
The thing is, it's always depicted in its white marble form. But according to an archaeological finding from the 1860s, the original statue was way much more colorful than that. According to archaeologists, the statue of Augustus de Prima Porta has a crimson tunic, yellow armor and a purple mantle. It's important to keep in mind that colors weren't made artificially as they are today. Artists could only produce color from natural resources, so purple, for example, was an extremely difficult color to make. Back in the day, they derived purple from the mucus of a rare species of snail. Meaning that anyone who used the color purple to pigment their art and clothes was powerful and wealthy. Well, this looked like enough proof for me that ancient statues weren't always white. But as we can judge by the look of our modern museums, there didn't seem to exist enough interest in the art community to further explore polychromy on the ancient statues. But remember that archaeologist we talked about, Brinkman? Well, he has been collecting data on polychromy since the 1980s. At a certain point, he even began making colored replicas of such statues. The technology used is far from simple. To reconstitute these ancient works of art, Brinkman makes a 3D plaster copy of them, then he paints them by hand with the help of his wife. To find out which color were used in the original sculptures, Brinkman uses UV light. Certain pigments glow under UV light, exposing traces that would otherwise be invisible. Take this colorful archer as an example. Look at these colors. This piece is the reconstruction of a marble archer in the costume of a horseman. To accurately depict the archer, restorers had to research a lot about the history of the region, where the art piece was originally found, since colors have a cultural meaning. That, together with UV technology, allowed for the reconstruction you can now see. It seems very far from the idea we have of what the Greeks would make, but this is supposed to look exactly like the original one. According to Brickman, we shouldn't be so surprised that ancient Western civilizations used bright colors to depict their realities. After all, the Romans and Greeks were heavily inspired by the works of art of Egyptian civilization, Old Mesopotamia and Asia. For example, if you look at the famous Egyptian Sphinx, you might be led to believe that it always looked that way. But that wasn't at all the case. Modern studies and virtual reconstructions of the monument show us that the monument was very colorful. The body of the statue is believed to have been painted terracotta, while the regal headdress that circles the head is meant to have been golden blue. All of these were considered important colors in Egyptian times, and it was only suitable to use them to depict a pharaoh. Fast food is an ancient concept. Well, sort of. Quick and easy meals on the go have been around since the Romans, but today, let's just trace it back to medieval times. They may not have had golden arches or drive throughs but people back then, too, knew how to grab a quick bite on the run. Imagine London in the late 12th century. There were small dwellings and not everyone had easy access to food storage or cooking tools. It was a bit of a struggle. Luckily, people could find a fast food joint by the Thames River in London. Travelers and citizens could swing by day and night and find all sorts of ready-to-eat goodies at different prices. Home cooking was a luxury few could afford back then. A study of 14th century life in Colchester, England, revealed that only a small percent of tax-paying households had their own kitchen. People without hearths or stoves had to prioritize expenses like paying rent and buying milk. Now let's talk about medieval fast food options. Meat pies and pasties were all the rage. Think of them as mini calzones, easy to carry and eat on the move. The bread was a staple in medieval diets because it was cheap, could last a while, and was made from easily available flour. Fast food joints were churning out bread-based food and treats like hotcakes, pancakes, wafers, and of course, those delicious pies and pasties. Bakers weren't allowed to charge more than a penny to bake your meat into a pastry, making it an option for those tight on cash. Customers could bring their own meat to be wrapped in bread and baked. But medieval fast food joints didn't always have the best reputation. 
Some of those cooks had sneaky tactics. They'd use excessive spices and herbs to cover up the taste of spoiled food. And let's not forget the questionable preparation practices and lack of regulations. Some cooks would use spoiled ingredients, sell old pasties that were about to go bad, and even pass off beef as venison. It wasn't a pretty picture. In fact, authorities would punish those cooks who were caught doing these. Besides cook shops, there were roasters on the way. If you wanted to get a quick bite, you could also stop by one of those that sold roast meat in the streets or pastry cooks. What about nutrition? Medieval diets were seriously lacking in many areas, whether you were a noble or a peasant. Both the rich and the poor suffered from a shortage of essential vitamins and nutrients needed for proper bodily functions. Interestingly enough, the poor had a slightly better chance of accessing fruits and veggies because they were considered peasant food. It was believed fresh produce couldn't be eaten raw and had to be cooked. Cooking some of those veggies resulted in a significant nutrient loss on top of their already insufficient diets. Now, let's talk more about the main course of the medieval diet. Carbohydrates galore! Bread, bread, and more bread! That's what fueled the days. Surprisingly, some experts argue that despite the questionable food practices, the medieval diet may have been better for you compared to what many people consume today. In a time when sugar was expensive, honey was the sweetener of choice. Gingerbread and cakes were flavored with honey and spices like ginger, cloves, and pepper. The bread was a staple, with many Europeans buying it from bakers instead of making it themselves. Soups and stews were served in bread bowls or trenchers, adding a delightful carb element to the meal. Medieval Europeans had a sweet tooth and enjoyed custards, cakes, and fritters. Funnel cakes, known as crispies, first appeared in this era, featuring figs, apples, and almonds as ingredients. Soft pretzels were also a popular treat. As I mentioned earlier, cook shops were the primary hubs for street food, and they were usually permanent structures clustered in specific areas. These shops varied in size, ranging from cozy to spacious, and they were often attached to dwellings. The regulations governing cook shops were minimal, requiring only signage. Plus, the food sold there had to adhere to town standards. Interestingly, some women operated cook shops right out of their homes, either selling food directly from their doors or setting up a special room where customers could enjoy their purchases. While cook shops couldn't sell raw food or offer lodging, pie bakers had their own dedicated shops. London also had bustling open-air markets where fresh produce, meat, fish, dairy products, and more were sold. It's possible that smaller-scale food vendors operated in these markets with less permanent setups. Additionally, there were heroines known as hucksters. These fabulous ladies played a significant role in food distribution in medieval hmm. cities, especially when it came to selling goods to the less fortunate. Hucksters operated on a small scale, buying goods to resell and often moving around the city, enticing customers with their tempting offerings. They sold a wide variety of goodies, including bread, ale, fish, grain, and vegetables. Usually, hucksters worked in impoverished neighborhoods. If we consider that there were no cooking facilities in such areas, it's possible that hucksters also sold prepared foods to feed hungry bellies on the go. They were the superheroes of street food. Of course, cook shops weren't just in England. In the past, the distinct regional specialties that we see in modern cuisine weren't well documented. Instead, what set medieval cuisine apart were the cereals and oils that influenced people's diets across different ethnic groups and, later on, national boundaries. The variations in eating habits across different areas were mainly due to differences in climate, political administration, and local customs throughout the continent. The climate was generally too harsh for growing grapes and olives in areas like the British Isles, northern France, northern German-speaking regions, Scandinavia, and the Baltic regions. Olive oil was widely used in Mediterranean cultures, but it remained a costly import in the north. People in the northern regions often used poppy, walnut, hazel, and filbert oils as more affordable alternatives. Butter and lard became more readily available and were used in significant amounts in the northern and northwestern regions. One ingredient that was nearly universal in middle and upper class cooking throughout Europe was almonds. Almond milk, 
A versatile and widely used substitute for dishes that required eggs or milk was very popular. However, it's worth noting that the bitter variety of almonds only gained popularity much later on. So, imagine yourself strolling through the lively streets of medieval Europe, feasting on savory meat pies, indulging in honeyed fritters and pretzels. Fast food may have a different meaning today, but the love for quick and delicious bites transcends time. Instead of food courts, there were bustling marketplaces where vendors sold piping hot pastries known as chewets or pasties. And let's not forget about the main medieval fair treat, fried dough. Think of it as their very own version of deep-fried delicacies we can't resist today. They would fry up doughy delights, sprinkle them with sugar or honey, and voila, instant sweet magic. People kept it simple with ingredients like dough, meat, veggies, and spices. None of those fancy artificial additives, preservatives, or unhealthy trans fats you find in modern-day junk food. Medieval fast food was different in terms of preparation methods, too. It was all about homemade charm and personal touch. People used traditional techniques like baking, frying, or grilling, putting their crafty hands to work. No industrial processes or standardized production methods like at today's junk food factories. I mean, let's face it, medieval fellas didn't have the same nutrition knowledge we do now. They may have indulged in their junk food, but they didn't intentionally engineer it to be addictive or super harmful, unlike today's junk food, which can be loaded with artificial flavors, sweeteners, and unhealthy levels of salt and fat. When we say modern fast food, we also need to include the marketing side. These days, you can't escape the bombardment of advertisements. It's everywhere, from fast food joints to convenience stores, shouting for your attention. But back in medieval times, junk food was more of a local affair. You had to wait for special occasions like fairs, markets, or festive gatherings to get your hands on some tasty treats.